Welcome to the Happiness Initiative Leadership Training Part 2. My name is Laura Musikansky with the Happiness Alliance. We have been working in cities, communities, on campuses with companies and even countries since 2010. And this, this tool, this resource that we are going, giving you here today is based on that experience. So hope that you learn a lot and that you are inspired to conduct a happiness initiative in your area to become a happiness movement leader. So we're going to go over data analysis and reporting. We'll show you an example of how to do a report. We're going to go over community meetings and feedback on data and then a little bit about decisions and budgeting using happiness data. So let's dive right into data analysis. Now that you have your team and you have your plans because you've completed the parts of um, that we went over in part one of the Happiness Initiative Leadership Training, you want to gather your data. Contact info at happycounts.org and we can provide you a unique URL to be able to gather your data. When Once you've gathered your data, you're going to get it in an Excel spreadsheet. And so you need to do some data analysis. And so if you don't have somebody on your team who's good at working with Excel's, Excel spreadsheets, then go ahead and bring somebody up on your team or we can help you hire somebody to do that. Here's an example of one way of showing data, showing the different indicators um, in different domains and the scores and then another where we can see data over time. So now you have your data and you want to show how to use it. I'm going to show you one, sh one report that we have, the Family Happiness Handbook, and it shows how people are doing in terms of sense of feeling loved. You can grab that, the, ha the Happiness Family Handbook, or you can also see how to use data in terms of um, influencing policymakers. You'll see here that we are looking at data for young people to, old, to people who are older to see how they feel about trust in government and that it's all pretty much quite low. So we want to think about how we're going to be using that data and what that says. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's essentially two camps when you're analyzing data. One is about levels of sufficiency. So saying that people who have reached a certain level of sufficiency, they're happy enough. And then the other one is looking at um, comparisons. So looking at how does one area compare to the other. So the, the issue about levels of sufficiency is who decides. Who decides who is going to be happy or unhappy? And there's another issue of, um, let's say that everybody has reached a level of sufficiency in terms of our subjective well-being indicators, but we still continue to have environmental degradation and in more, perhaps um, inequality for other people outside of the area that we're measuring. So the third issue with levels of sufficiency is that um, some people who have low scores are actually in certain domains are actually quite happy. And we'll talk about this later. Um, and what does that mean? Because I, for me, I think that those are, so there's some key insights about that. And some people who are quite high in many of the domains are actually rather grumpy and unhappy. And what does this mean? Um, so I think that that is actually very important in terms of people who on paper, like we would say on paper, they don't have the right to be happy because their scores aren't high enough, but are actually quite happy. They have some real wisdom that we can draw from and learn about in terms of how are we going to sustainably reach happiness and well-being and ecological health in our world. So I leave that with that with you with those thoughts and to really think about what that what that would mean. So I talked earlier about levels of sufficiency in terms of data analysis and this one is comparisons. So we'll see in the United Kingdom they use comparisons so you can see how happy people are in terms of their life satisfaction in terms of their feelings um, over time. And then you can also see how people are compared 
in in different areas of, for example, the United Kingdom, and you'll also see that um, in the European Union, and also the World Happiness Report has that for different countries. So when you hear that um, Finland is the happiest country or I, Iceland is the happiest country, um, that's the World Happiness Report ranking them. And you've probably also heard about the Happy Planet Index, where um, it's based on three factors, where it's Costa Rica or these other countries that are the happiest. And that's good information. The ranking gives good information because um, it, it can help us understand what are the, the different circumstances in different areas that contribute or support happiness. But there's a caveat, there's one of the problems with, with ranking is that is, is, is should happiness be a competition? Would you want to be the happiest country? And the, the answer to this is let's redirect. Let's really think about our mission and our purpose and our values and that we're not competing to be happiest. What we're really doing is we're trying to bring about a world where all beings have the opportunity, have the equal opportunity to pursue their happiness. So we've talked a little bit about happiness and gathering data, but once you've gathered your data and you've thought about how you're going to talk about your data, what kind of data stories you're going to um, tell, you also want to be thinking about objective indicators or objective metrics because you want to give a balanced picture. And an ex example of a balanced picture would be something like a gross domestic product per capita, right? So that's something that you can probably pretty easily get for your area. But then there's the piece of sense that a person has enough money um, that they want, that they have enough money to buy the things that they want. So if gross domestic product per capita so is very high, or even if an individual has a very high income, and yet they still don't feel that they have enough money to buy the things that they want, that tells one story as opposed to if it's low, if you have a low income area, and yet they do feel like they have enough money to buy the things that they want, which does happen, um, that tells another story. And there is some wisdom to gather from each and some actions that a policymaker would want to take or even an individual would want to take in their lives based on one, either of those or any combination of situations. So some tips on gathering your objective indicators. Um, use the indicators that are already in place. Fewer is better. Usually you would want to have about 10 indicators, no more than 12 or 13 indicators for, um, for a report. It's otherwise it becomes overwhelmed. And um, work with organizations that are already gathering the data. So if you're from a uh, government, you're already gathering the data. If you are a nonprofit or an individual leading a project, then work with other nonprofits or, or the government that is already gathering the data. And if you've selected an indicator for a domain to reflect well-being and there's no data, you don't discard the indicator. Instead, Note that the lack of availability of data, that's important information, as important as the data oftentimes. So that's a little bit about objective indicators and subjective indicators. Um, there's more tools and resources at the Happiness Alliance at happycounts.org where you can learn more uh, about this for, from different presentations like this as well as different publications. So I'm going to show you a little bit about happiness reporting. So the first and most important thing, like with your initial strategy, is to know what your purpose is. So there's different purposes that we've seen our happiness index used for. There's an assessment where people are looking at how are different populations doing or looking at how we're doing over time. There's fundraising. We've seen people use our happiness and communities use our happiness index to bring in um, grants or to bring in other funds. And then there's publication. Lots of researchers have used our happiness index. And policy, we've seen policymakers um, use ran often random sampling to, um, to use the, a report on the, the happiness index for their community. And then there's, um, to s I'd say, storytelling. So telling people stories and raising awareness. So that's a little bit about, about um, 
data gathering and a little bit about it reporting. And it's really important that you do know your purpose and have enough information that you can make this inf make this data and these data stories meaningful to people. So now convening your community. So you've gone out, you've gathered your data, now you have your report, and now you want to convene your community and tell them about it. Um, so these are some of the tips and the tools and the resources from the work that we've been doing since 2010. So you want to, to gather your community, you want to use the bridges in your team. So the bridges are those people or those organizations that people that people that their people they're connected to will listen to and will follow. Um, will will come when they convene a meeting or will read an article when they're um, when they issue an article, these kinds of things. So those those bridges um, can be communities, they can be individuals, they can be uh, uh, news sources, they can be, they will bring people together and um, it's really important that they're on your team and that you use them and they've been part of the process the whole time, hopefully, in your happiness initiative. So here are some models for gathering feedback. There's two different models we'll go over very briefly. World Cafe style meetings. You can look at them online and here we have some, um, just some of the steps. And that's where you bring people together and you gather, you show them the data and then you gather from them what they think should happen in terms of enhancing what, how enhancing the happiness and well-being of their community, of their city, of their country, of their company. And then another model would be crowdsourcing. And so you can do a blend of crowdsourcing um, and experts or just crowdsourcing where you can um, ask people online or ask people on different formats and newsletters. Here's the data. Here's the report. What do you think? Um, what, what do you think should happen? So there's all kinds of different models that you can use. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can learn about these models on happycounts.org. You'll read some of the, if you read some of the papers there. So a little bit more about data. We talked about this in the who, what, where, when, where, how, how um, presentation. And so you want to think about how are you going to present the data and how is it going to be meaningful. So we're going to show you very quickly here a report on money and happiness from one of the happiness report cards that the Happiness Alliance has issued. So here we have, this is, this is presented to give people an idea about happiness and money. And you can see there's lots of strong visuals as well as questions and information that is introducing the idea of a paradigmatic shift from money-based to well-being-based and really trying to get people to think about um, in their own lives what is their relationship between how much they make or how much they want to make and their own happiness and well-being. So here you see some data um, that we have gathered with the happiness index and then you also see some of the science that we spoke about in that who, what, when, where, how presentation where we talked about Richard Layard and his research on gross domestic product and happiness. And this is also backed up by Easterlin. And then there's more information about um, what it is you can do, kind of different ways of thinking about how you can use your money if you have a higher income and bring about happiness. So that's going into issues of um, of giving. We talked about the three lessons from positive psychology, giving uh, and generosity, gratitude and mindfulness. So here, again, you'll see more of looking at um, really bringing in very personal way of thinking about happiness and happiness data and some tips that a person can do in their own lives. So this is just one way that you can present, I'm showing here, here one, one way that you can present to your community um, the, the, the way to present the, um, the data and information so that people can really take it personally. Because when people hear about a happiness report card or happiness data, they want something they can take personally. They don't want just a solid um, 
numbers-based report or just something that is just about policy. They want something that is very personal as well. So I urge you to, to, to blend it all together. So there we have it. So this is because data is complex and because humans are complex, um, use the data in a way that really matters to people. All right, so let's talk a little bit some of the ways that data, happiness data can be used. So um, we can use it to inform us on what kinds of policies that we want to make. And we have a screening um, policy tool that you can access through an article that we have published. You can also learn about this is based on Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index, and they have their own screening tool that they um, that they use. And then with their permission, we created this tool that you can use. And you can learn how to use that in the Happiness Policy Handbook um, and also in a, in a publication that we have online at happycounts.org. So we won't go into that, but please do read the Happiness Policy Handbook and, or that publication to learn more about that. So let's look at some of the ways that happiness data is being used right now. I mentioned in uh, the other presentation in New Zealand, they're using their happiness data for budgeting, for a sort of participatory budgeting. Um, another way that you could use it is through um, a public process of participatory budgeting. That would be a way that would be newer, but there's a participatory budgeting um, so if you were to present a um, present to your community the happiness status of the community and then ask people how to allocate funds, how they would like to allocate funds. In New Zealand, they're doing this internally, but externally it seems to be the obvious next step. Um, governments are setting priorities based on happiness index um, have their own happiness data that's happening in Indonesia and other areas in the all throughout the European Union now. Every single nation now is gathering data and we'll see them starting to develop priorities. And then we're also um, let's, for reflections on participatory budgeting. So other ways that you can use happiness data in your community say if you're not a policy maker, I mentioned earlier, would be for fundraising. So you've got some really good data, you can set some goals and you can write some grants and you can um, gather some donations. So you want to match your outcomes to your goals and you use your happiness index data to be able to show that you're making an impact. There you have it. And I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. This is part two of the Happiness Initiative Leadership Training. We've gone over everything very quickly. Um, but you can learn a lot more with the Happiness Policy Handbook and also on our website at happycounts.org. This presentation, as well as this video, is copyright at happycounts.org. If you want to use it, please email happycounts.org, info at happycounts.org, or me, Laura, at happycounts.org. And please buy the Happiness Policy Handbook and donate to the Happiness Alliance. Thank you.